ephemeral. There's technology that will migrate containers between live running and compute instances. So you can literally have a container move from one server and a data center to another server without losing data and things like that. Um, but typically it's more ephemeral than a virtual machine. They're much faster to boot up, but they're partitioned off and isolated from the main operating system so for security reasons. Like your code's running in a container next to my container, we don't necessarily want those to be able to see each other or talk to each other at all. Right. If we were just on a shared server, there's potential for memory well, leaks or other thing, vulnerabilities to allow us to see each other's code. So it's like a that. more secure virtual machine than from my... I don't know that it's more secure than a virtual machine. Oh, it is, yeah, because it's um, isolated. Yeah. You can run um, thousands. Uh, Pantheon actually has some, or used to have some machines that ran thousands of containers on one. Oh, yeah, and, so like, the um, benchmark is that you can run like 10,000 containers where you can run like 100 but they're virtual all, machines. They're all they isolated is. up to the kernel level. Now, they have it, their own operating system. It might have changed since I was there, but it was all isolated up to the kernel level, but they sh shared, um, they were using CoreOS. David used to be big into CoreOS. And um, CoreOS, so at the kernel, you, you, all of them shared the same kernel, right. but that was it. And it was much more difficult to, um, to, 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 break into, um, to, to break into it at that kernel level. But it's far more performant than a virtual machine. Oh, heck yeah. Is it as resource heavy? No. no. Okay. Because the, the... Hang on. Yeah, go ahead. The aerodynamics of elephants are difficult, so you might want to hold on to that. But there you go. You ready? Since you asked a lot of questions and there's only two of you and you're a vendor. <laughs> there you go. Okay, let's get started. <laughs> oh, I do it all the time. That and my dog. My dog is the best PHP programmer I know because I've been talking to her for six, eight years now. So solves a lot of problems for you, right? <laughs> um, okay, we're going to talk about um, some of the things. This is called the Elephant's New Tricks. Um, we're talking about some things that are going to happen in PHP 7, and, or that have happened in PHP 7. And if I have enough time left, um, we're going to talk about some of the things in PHP 8. Now, I'm used to dealing with not large audiences, but a little bigger than two, so... Um, there was a big party last night. Obviously. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you've got questions, please stop me. If we don't get through all the slides, I really don't care, okay? Um, um, is there a way to download the slides after the fact? Is it all going to be on the same website? No, but if you drop me an email, cal at calevans.com, I will send you a PDF of these slides. Um, I'll have to clean it up. There are... 80 some odd slides in this deck. Um, I've hidden a lot of them because I don't cover those topics uh, on these shorter talks. Okay, first thing, errors. PHP is moving away from the fatal error, okay? Uh, yes. um, it, we're getting away from the days of the white screen of death or worse yet, log spew that your user has no idea what to do with. Um, errors, uh, the, the, the engine is now uh, much more error oriented and it is getting even better. In PHP 8 there's a lot of stuff that is being converted to errors that are currently not converted to errors. I shared this, I'm doing a contract with a company up in DC and I shared an article over the weekend about um, some of the things coming down the pipe in PHP 8 and one of them is they're converting a lot of warnings and errors into, or uh, fatal errors into catchable errors. And um, one of my coworkers says, I think what this means is our log files are not going to have nearly as many errors. Our code just isn't going to work. So um, you've got to be aware of this. Now, errors are like exceptions. You can catch them um, just like exceptions. They um, actually share a, um, a same, the same hierarchy. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. A little I got bit more confused. maybe like JavaScript handles error. Yes and catches and yes um, and the the core is committed um, to making uh, getting rid of all the the fatal errors uh, this is great it's, it's wonderful for web services it's even better for long-running processes I had one process that ran for three months solid um, and it was um, it was monitoring Twitter and then it hit a SSL error which is technically a recoverable error Twitter just barfed for a moment but after three months it hit that and said, oh, okay it's done well, now I can catch that. Now, most errors are not recoverable, okay? Uh, most errors, the, the reason they're in here is not so you can recover and keep running. It's so that you can um, 
exit gracefully. Notify someone. If it's 3 a.m., you make sure that um, your boss gets called and that kind of stuff. Or but, restart the process. Or yeah, but possibly. It, um, possibly you can restart it. But most errors, um, most errors, not exceptions, um, are fatal errors that we're not going to be able to recover from. And here's what one looks like. Um, okay, if we call method on null, that's not going to work, okay? And that normally would throw a um, fatal exception. Well, now we can gracefully shut down. Um, nobody would actually do that, but if you have a method called call method, you pass in an object, and that object is actually a null, you could make this error. And I've, I've done this, um, in, I've been working on a contract, uh, this contract that I'm working on, and I, I hit a point where it kept saying, calling this method on null. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not calling it. Oh, I forgot to initialize that object. So, you know, that's usually the situation. Now we can gracefully shut down. Gracefully shut down means anything from notifying pagerly to that you've got a problem to just writing something out in the log file. You know, it doesn't have to be anything big. Um, the structure of this is we now have a throwable interface in the core and error implements the throwable interface just like exception, okay? Um, and we're gonna talk about type hinting in a little bit and um, we got that new type hinting errors. Um, the difference, the biggest difference between errors and exceptions is you cannot create your own errors in um, user land. The error is in the engine, you cannot subclass it. Um, you know, we subclass exceptions a lot of things. I got four or five of them in this one project that um, simply are flags, this happened, you know, and you're gonna keep going, but you throw the exception so I can deal with that, um, that one condition. Errors are not like that. Errors are, we are going down. The question is, are you gonna put the lifeboats or not? So that's where it um, comes into play. Is there a catch-all? Yes. Um, you can catch the throwable interface. And I usually do this, um, I do a lot of work with the Symphony command line. The Symphony command line, or com command component has one overriding script. This is where it all starts. It would be your index.php. And I wrap my run in a try, and I catch throwable. So if nothing else catches it, whatever it is, is gonna, since it implements throwable, it's going to be caught there, and I can it basically at that point I just log it. I don't do anything special, but um, that if you is. Wanted to like terminate an HTML page or something. You, regardless, yeah. you could catch it there. Yes, um, in your index.php, if you want to catch, um, even if you know your, uh, if your you know, your index.php just fires off your run or something like that, wrap that in a catch throwable slash throwable. Um, you have to have that slash if you're using uh, namespaces but slash throwable, and then you can catch everything else. Anything that's not caught up the line. And there's a lot of stuff. I'll catch my little flag exceptions and stuff like that, but if I know that I've got that in there, I won't bother to try to catch everything in my application. I'll, I'll say, you know, just let that bubble up. It's gonna error. My catch is going to um, catch it, log it. I'm good. Um, and this is also gives us multiple exception catching. Um, we can now catch this exception or the pipe, that exception. Now, you're gonna see this syntax a lot um, the, the, where you've got multiple things. Um, we're about to see, uh, at the end of this, I talk about um, being able to uh, return multiple types uses the same syntax. The problem with this is there's no physical limit that the engine imp, Im, um, implements on how many of these you can do, okay? You can chain 50 of those out there. Practically, that is gonna make for bad code, okay? You're not gonna be able to maintain that. So use this sparingly, but if you've got two or three exceptions that are the same, this is a very easy way to do the same thing with all of them. Tight pinning. We're gonna camp here for a minute. This is my favorite, okay? Um, first of all, I've read the articles and there are people who say, oh, type pinning is nothing more than visual debt. No, type pinning is very important. Type pinning allows us as developers to write self-documenting code. Now, I still write doc blocks at the top of all my major, or actually all my functions. I put them up there, but I no longer put parameter and returns and stuff like that because that's already in the code. 
I don't need to constantly do that. And what I always found, and maybe this is just me, but I would write my function and I would immediately, or I would um, start my function, I would immediately put my doc clock up there, and I'm thinking it through and says, oh, this is going to take this and this and this and return that. Well, invariably, as I started writing the code, well, that's not exactly right. I need this extra parameter, and maybe it doesn't return a bool, maybe it returns a float, okay? Well, I forgot to update my doc clock. I always forget to update the doc clock. Self-documenting code with type hints, you don't have to remember to do that. So, 7.0 gave us scalar type hints. We've been able to type hint since 5.6, okay? But with only with um, our own objects. 7.0 gave us scalar type hints. We got string, we got bool, we got int, all of those. 7.0 also gave us return type hints. Yay, we're all happy. Uh, 7.1 gave us nullable type hints. At this point, type hints are actually usable, okay? Because there's a lot of time where Null is a valid option, but with type hints, you don't have nullable, you can't do that. Um, and then 7.2 gave us the object type hint. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. 7.3 gave us widening. That's always a fun one. Um, and then 7.4 gave us typed properties in our objects. All the stuff that we've been doing, we can now do with our um, object, with the things we've been doing with our method signatures, we can now do with our properties in our objects. That's exciting. Okay, so there are eight type hints, int, float, string, bool, array, callable, iterable, and object. And I used to go off on object, but um, I use object a lot more than I like to admit these days, so we'll talk about that in just a minute. So what is it? Okay, we've got a public function in one of our um, objects called post, and post takes a URL and a payload. Well. Being developers, we can kind of figure out, okay, this is going to post something to an API somewhere. But what is URL and what is payload? Is URL just a string that's a URL? Is URL an array of the different parts of the URL that I've got to put together? At this point, I've got to read the code or read the doc block and hope the doc block's up to date just to know what to do here. Well, we start doing type pins. Okay, URL is a string. Now things are coming together for me. Now I know that's a string. I can use that in Guzzle. I'm hoping you're using Guzzle to do um, your, your um, API work. But I can use the string in Guzzle and I can do a get or a post. Payloads an array. Okay, now I know because I use uh, Guzzle that I, if I'm doing a post and I've got a string as my URL and I've got an array that all I've got to do is have that JSON block and hand it my payload I'm pretty much done. I now know how to use post. I know that when I want to call post, I pass it a string and I pass it array and we're good. Now, some people, I, 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 I've made the statement that um, type hints save us from having to write tests. And I had a major framework author go off on me because it, you know, oh, it doesn't, doesn't cause us not to have to write tests. Well, yes it does, just not unit tests, okay? I've been coding since 1985, 86, and I can tell you in every procedural um, function I've done or in every object that, uh, method that I've had, I've always had to check and make sure I've got the parameters that I expect. I have to make sure that I've got a string if I'm going to call um, a, a, an API, that URL has got to be a string. This is the kind of test that we no longer have to write. I no longer have to say, if this is not a string, throw an exception, because the engine's going to do that for me already. I don't have to worry about it. Okay? So this saves me from writing these. And if you've got a method with five or six um, parameters in there, and you've got to check each one of them, and you almost always have to, this saves you a lot of code. That is visual debt that we don't need. Strict type headings help us reduce the overall lines of code that we have to write. Um, and declaring strict typing only affects the scalar type hints. And when PHP effect, um, enforces these type hints, you don't have to enforce them in your code. Now, this is the secret sauce. You have to put this at the top of every file that you want strict types enforced in, okay? Um, this is the one odd thing about type hints is it is file by file. This does not cascade down. You don't have to, you can't do it that way. And there's a reason behind this. 
If you use Composer, and my God, I hope you're using Composer to install stuff, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of packages that started, and starting in 7.0, started requiring strict types. But that doesn't affect your code. Your code can or doesn't have to, but the libraries can enforce strict types in their own. So that's why this has to be in each file that you want it enforced in. If you don't have it, the strict types will still compile, but what we have is weak type hinting. So instead of being direct uh, and easily identifiable, it might be more generic error. Uh, and more gen uh, generic error. No, uh, weak type hinting means it's not going to throw a type error, but PHP is going to still say, "Oh, you wanted an int here, but you passed me a string with the number two or the numeral two in it. Let me convert that for you." Um, with strong or with strict typing. If it says int and you pass in a string, it will throw a type error, period. You're done. <clears throat> so, with strict types declared up here, I've got a function called sum that takes two integers and it multiplies them, right? No, it adds them, okay? And it returns that. If I set strict typing to one, it's only gonna run this first one because the second one, these are not integers. And so this is gonna get triggered. It's gonna um, display the message and then we're going to get none or done. If strict typing is anything but one, zero, two, whatever, it doesn't matter, okay, then both of these are going to run. And it's going to try to convert these to integers for us. Try to. It won't successfully, but it's going to, uh, PHP does try to coerce, just like, um, and PHP's been doing coercing since three, I think, um, and the rules for PHP's coercing are very well defined, but the easy one to remember is if you pass in a string with the numeral two and you're using it as an integer, PHP will attempt to convert that to an integer for you, okay? Um, so it's one of the few languages, if not the only language, that does this. We get a lot of crap for that. Why did my, where did my mouse go? It's, there's a lot of weird errors that type hinting saves you from because you didn't you didn't realize your object or your value got mutated somewhere along the way, or you just forgot to put it in as a string or an integer. And or you got it back from the database, and um, MySQL used to. It doesn't anymore, but it used to ignore all types, and everything came back as strings. So, you know, you could define it as a float in your database. You were still getting 2.5 back from in, as a string from MySQL. And uh, uh, until we got PDO, that was the, the, the booger to remember is, if I want to use this as a number, I really need to convert it as a number. Thankfully, uh, Wes Furlong, when he, did, uh, when he did PDO, fixed all that for us. Um, nullable type hints allow us to say, we will pass specifically this type or nothing at all. Or a, a no, I'm sorry, or a null. A null is not nothing. A null is, well, in the database world, a null means we don't know, but a null is a specific thing. It is not nothing. We do null, nullable type hints by putting the question mark in front of the type hint. <clears throat> now, I realize I talk fast and I blow through a lot of this stuff. I'm glad you're asking questions. Please do not hesitate to ask questions, okay? Otherwise, I'm going to assume you're getting all this and I'm just going to keep going. <clears throat> Sometimes it's about having the wording the question correctly. I'll let you know. That's fine. Okay. Null type hints are not the same thing as specifying a default value. A lot of people get confused about this in PHP. We can define default values if something, if we don't pass in a parameter. That's not the same as a nullable type. We can do this. We can say, I'll take a string or null. I'll take an array or null, but if I don't pass in an array, or I'm sorry, if I don't pass in anything in the second parameter, then it's going to default to an empty array. If I pass in a null in the second parameter, then payload will be a null. It will not be an empty array. I can't believe I forgot my clicker. Object type in. I used to go off on this. I used to hate it. Um, I, I have found that more and more I use it uh, quite often, especially when I'm getting stuff back from um, APIs. I'm getting stuff back from an API. The first thing I do is, of course, JSON encode it, because if it's not JSON, it is old school SOAP and XML. Who wants that? Who wants that? Uh, but I, I, I do a JSON decode, and JSON decode, by default, 
creates an, uh, creates a, an object. I can use my post function, string, and I say object as a payload. And I come down here, I call my func post. I can decode an empty array, an empty JSON array. And that's actually are going to create, actually, yeah, and that's actually going to create an empty object. And that's legal. Again, it used to be, I, I'd say, why would anybody want to use this? Because it is very vague, okay? And the whole point of type hinting is to be very specific. But uh, when you're dealing with, especially when you're dealing with APIs and JSON payloads and everything, um, the object, especially the object return type, is your friend. That means you don't have to convert it to something else, or worse yet, you don't have to um, tell JSON to code to make it an array. Um, I've gotten to the point, I've got a friend, uh, Larry Garfield, who um, has a talk that he does at a lot of PHP conferences about stop using arrays, use objects. And I never did really understand it until I sat down and listened to his talk, and he's got some great points. If you ever get a chance to see Larry give that talk. Return type hints help developers create self documenting code. I repeat this several times because it is so important. Um, type hints will keep you from having to write checks on all your um, your parameters. It will help you understand it better, but that self-documenting code, that's the important thing because you can look at the function signature and say, I know how to use this. I don't have to read the code to understand how to use this. Yeah, skip one. <coughs> Return type ends. Woohoo! Okay, I've got my class foo, and that's got my function post. And I have said that post is going to return an int. That colon is the syntax for it, colon and one of the scalar type ints, or your own class. Okay, you don't have to use the scalar type ints, you can still use your own classes in any of these. But since I specified an int, and I'm returning cal was here, which is obviously a string, this is going to throw me a type error. Okay. Um, return types do not honor the strict typing that you put in there. They, if you put a return type in there, it is a contract with the deity of your choice. If you say int, it will be an int or it will not run, period. And then we can also do nullable type hints just like we could do nullable parameters. I'm saying that I'm going to return a string or I'm going to return nothing at all. Return semicolon is return, returning a null, okay? So if you don't know if your, um, client, your method is going to return this type, make it nullable. That way you can simply return out of it. Now, you got other issues in your code you've got to deal with, like it, whatever's calling post now has to deal with the fact that it could return a null. I personally would much rather say I'm always going to return a string and throw an exception anytime that that is not going to happen, and that way I can deal with it elsewhere. But how you structure your code is your point or is your problem. Just make sure if you're going to use, a, if you're not going to return a string, make sure that that question mark is there. Self-documenting code. This is new in 7.2 seven, seven or 7.3. Void means I'm not going to return anything at all. Okay, and no, I told you wrong. I told you that return semicolon would return a null. It will not. If you say that something is going to return a string or a null, question mark string, then you have to either return a string or return null. Okay. okay. Void is nothing at all. Return semicolon or no return statement at all in your method, that's a, that's a void. And quite honestly, these days, about half my methods do this because they do what they want. I'm throwing exceptions. Um, Echo the output or something. Huh? Echo the output. Yeah. So you don't need to return anything. You don't need to return. Uh, quite honestly, I used to, almost all my uh, methods used to return a Boolean. Did this work or did this not? These days, I throw exceptions if it doesn't work. I don't need a return at this point. I don't need to capture that and say, if not this method, then do something because my catch is going to um, do something and I am very specific deep in my code I'm very specific about what I catch I just let everything bubble up okay if I don't want to deal with it right here then the next level up will catch it or my final throwable will catch it log it and deal with it 
Void. <laughs> I put this in here because somebody asked. You cannot have question mark void. Okay, that will throw an engine error. It won't even compile. You can't say I'm going to return null or nothing. Won't work. That's one of those. You ever wonder why the the the, the shampoo bottle says do not eat? Okay, that slides in there because somebody asked. This will not compile. Okay, void is not nullable, or void is not null. Type properties. I'm excited about this one. <coughs> Type properties. Up to this point, we've been talking about methods and the signature, the, the parameters passed into a method and the return type back from a method. Now we can do this in our classes. I can say public int ID. And if this is not, when I try to set it, if this is not an int and I've got strict typing turned on, this will throw a type error. Okay? Now, there, do I have a slide on that? Hang on. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a few rules. Types on static properties are now supported, so you can have them on static. Uh, void and callable are not supported on object properties. So don't try to set this property as a void. Okay, not that you would want to, but that's one of those, if somebody ever asks, you can't do that. Um, nullable, the question mark, is supported. And that's very important. Um, without strict types, it's coercive. It will try to coerce whatever you pass in to these values. Um, with, strict, um, with strict types turned on, it will throw um, errors, type errors, if you pass in a, a string and it, the property is set to an int. Uh, Non-private properties are invariant. Okay. Non yeah, non-private, okay. Um, if it's protected or if it's public, once it's set as a type, it's set. It cannot change, okay? <clears throat> Just to make sure, I actually ran all this code in 7.3 and 7.4 before I um, told you these things. So I've got class A, and Class A has, dollar, or has property A, B, and C. And property A is a private Boolean. But in class B, which extends this, I change that to a public string. This is allowed because A was private to begin with. So I can change that to public, and I can change its um, type. At this point, it's now set in stone because it's a public property. I can no longer change the type on that, OK? I can change the value all I want. I can't change the type. Um, and then public on B, I added the knowable. That's not possible because I have already defined it as a public property. And on this one, I took off the knowable on C. That's not allowed. Once it's a protected or public property, you cannot change the type of it at all. Oh. oh. Yeah, I told you there was, um, there was something uh, very important. The nullable is very important on properties, okay? Because if you set a property as string, and in your constructor you do not define it, it is technically a null. And it's going to live as a null until you attempt to read it, at which point you're going to get a type error, okay? The engine will let you do this. Now, the easy way around this is when you define the property, then say, you know, if it's a string, say dot string dollar sign A equals quote quote. At that point, it's a string, you'll have no problems. The other way around this is to put the nullable um, question mark in front of string, and that way when you attempt to read it, the engine will say, oh, it's null, but it's okay that it's null. I'm not going to get a type, in, uh, a, a type error. Do I have? I think I have source code for that. Nope, I do not have source code for that. That one is, I, I need to put a slide with source code on that. That one is really the only weird thing about type hints. Everything to me, everything else to me makes sense on type hints except for this one. There's a reason behind it. You have to understand that the engine doesn't want to enforce the fact that you have to create with default values, but you have to have that nullable in front of it if you're going to read it before you initialize it. So either initialize your, all your, your properties uh, when you're building the class, or in your constructor, initialize all of those, um, with the, all those that are type hinted. <coughs> okay, building 
anything on that? I get to 11.30. Eh, we're not going to make it. Okay. Um, we have covariant returns and contravariant par uh, parameters. And these are brought to you by those, engine, or by those core developers that just love big words. Okay? Here's what that means. Um, which one is this one? Okay. Okay. Here, we've actually changed... No? Interface extends. Function M. Those are exactly the same. I screwed up that slide. Um, here's what this means. Return, return variable or return properties can widen. Return property can return. Let me make sure I get this right because this is very difficult. HP does not allow you to choose less specific. Yes. Okay. Um, covariate returns and contravariant properties. Um, PHP does not allow you to choose a less specific or more specific type, even though it is type safe. Bottom, uh, there's what I'm looking for. Parameters can be substituted for one of its parents. Okay. If B subclasses A, then you can um, you can go with B or A. You can change it to um, A. You can change the property type to A because you can go up. Return values are the opposite. A return value you can pass in the uh, an object or any of, or you can specify an object or any of its children, and that's going to work. Okay. So contravariant um, properties you can specify a class or any of its parents. Covariant returns you can specify an object or any of its children. They don't go the other way around. I need to work on that section. The, the, the slides on that are not. Okay, now we get to some of the more fun stuff. <clears throat> Null coalesce. Now, I'm an old database programmer. Well, I'm an old programmer, but I'm an old database programmer. And we've had, co um, we've had coalesce operators in SQL uh, since SQL 91, I believe. And um, use them an awful lot because there's very few times you want your database to return a, an actual null. We use them in the database, but we don't usually want to return them to the users. <coughs> so now we have them in PHP. And honestly, they're just syntactical sugar. I can say that string equals is set my string, my string, or an empty string. Now I can say that string equals my string. Question, question, empty string. And what this is going to say is, if my string doesn't exist, then make, then use this one, OK? Uh, which is really nice, because we can now make sure that all of our properties have, uh, or all of our variables have a default value. Um, I work, like I said, a lot with the Symphony command. And Symphony command, you have um, parameters that are optional. You know, when a command line, you know, dash dash add. Well, if dash dash add isn't passed in, it doesn't exist. But I want to make sure that I have something in that parameter. So I say add equals the um, whatever the command is to pull the parameter. Get param add question mark question mark false. Okay? That way, if you don't specify anything, I know for sure that my add, val my add variable has a value of false. You can chain these. You can chain these. Um, you can say, um, oh, no, that's the, yeah. That's the same thing. Let's go back to the other slide. Boy, these, I really thought, I mean, I spent hours on these slides updating them and got them wrong still. Um, was it late at night? <laughs> no, I was working on these a um, good chunk of Friday uh, updating them. This is a, a talk that I've, uh, I've updated um, for the past four years, but obviously some of my slides are not marked as um, don't show. Um, you can chain these. I can say my string equals, or my string, that string equals my string, question mark, question mark, this string, question mark, question mark, empty string. And what it's going to do is it's going to go down the line until it finds the first non-null value or the first variable that does exist. And that's going to be 
the value of that string. And I always put the default value at the end. That's not actually required. You can have two or three variables um, there. But by putting a default there, I go, if nothing else catches, then it's going to do this. Now, with everything uh, in PHP, you know, you can abuse this. You, there's no limit to how many variables you can chain there. Uh, but practically, you know, if you get more than three or four, question how you got to this point in your life. No, uh, <laughs> look at re rewriting that code because that, that's not going to be maintainable code. But the null coalesce allows us to easily make sure that um, a, ver a value exists. It also is one of the few functions that if you use a variable that doesn't exist, this is not going to throw an error. So if, if my string has not been defined, I can say that string equals my string question mark question mark um, empty string. That string will be empty string. PHP will not throw a notice. It will not throw a warning. It will not do anything. It will just keep moving because that's what it's designed for. So if there is a situation where you're going to be using variables that you may or may not exist, use the null coalesce operator to make sure that you've got a value there. Flexible here docs. I'll be honest with you. I hate here docs. When I see it in code, it's just, it just grates on me. But up to this point, um, here docs, you had to have things lined up. Spaces were very important. Um, and and indent, indentation was very important. And if you didn't have it lined up just right, it would not work. Now, oh, that's the, this, is, this is a 7.4 feature? No, this was a 7.2 feature. Oh, okay. So this is actually out there now. Um, now, we can do here doc with no indentation, or we can do it with indentation. It doesn't matter. Okay, this was one of the nice little things that if you, if you do use here docs, this is going to save you from pulling out your hair, okay? Because here docs have traditionally been very difficult to work with. And they just don't look as great. They don't, no. Um, if you're using here docs, there are several valid reasons why you would use here docs, okay? I don't mean to, um, to diss on them. On the other hand, um, it's one of those that I don't usually use. I would much rather um, use require or include and have it in a separate file and bring it in because it, to me it makes the code look ugly. Because if you're using here doc, chances are really good that you're either using it to build JavaScript or HTML. You, you've worked on WordPress. You know, it's, 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 it's awful. It's, <laughs> okay, it's preloading. It's deep from that. <clears throat> My buddy Dimitri, who used to work for Zend for a long time, um, Zend actually paid Dimitri to uh, do nothing but work on the engine. Um, and Dimitri is responsible for about 95% of the speed improvements that um, we got with PHP 7. Um, he's a wonderful guy based over in Russia. He still does a lot of work with PHP. He just doesn't work for Zend anymore. Anyhow, preloading. Preloading is built on top of opcache, but it is not opcache. See, opcache just takes everything and um, compiles it and stores the opcode. But there's a lot more to it. Um, the opcodes are the compiled version of your code. And it's actually, these days, it's possible to actually see the opcodes uh, if you use some of the right tools. Um, I don't recommend it. But the opcodes, where did my mouse go? There we go. The opcodes are just the compiled version. If I've got a class that implements an interface, then I've got to, the, the opcode just stores the compiled version of that. It's still got to run that to say, oh, okay, I've got to have this interface. Preloading does everything the opcache does, but it also goes ahead and links the interfaces and links the subclasses and all that together and stores that. So you get a lot more than just the opcode uh, caching. If you're using opcode or uh, opcaching, then um, you're getting a speed performance, but you probably know that there are things like you can tell it if, um, if a file changes, redo the up, okay? You can't do that with preloading. <coughs> preloading takes a certain list of classes, and you get to define what the, you get to define the, the files that are brought in, in the preloading. Um, you have a file um, that most people just call preload.php that is loaded when your web server comes up, 
and it goes ahead and brings those files in and does the opcode caching and does the linking and everything and holds them in memory. They don't go away unless you bounce the server. You know, if you're using Apache, unless you bounce Apache, not the server itself. Um, which is just wonderful for speed. Um, they have they estimate that the average website using Drupal or WordPress or some other CMS is going to see a five to 13, 14 percent increase in speed just by doing this. And yes, if you've got the RAM, you can load all of Drupal, all the subclasses and everything. You can preload them right in there. You'll take a hit when the server comes up because it's got to run through all that, but you only take that hit once. If you're working in a shared environment, this won't work for obvious reasons. You don't want your neighbor's WordPress or your neighbor's Drupal preloaded, <laughs> but there's no segregation on this. Okay? So if you're working in a, a container, this will work. If you're working on a virtual machine, this will work. If you're working in a shared hosting environment, this yeah. will work. I do a lot of work with SiteGround. I love SiteGround. But until I get up into their uh, managed plans or managed server plans, this won't work. But this will give us a little bit more speed improvement. Uh, the PHP 7 branch has been just known for the fact that it has speed improvement. So the PHP 7.0 sped up most, web most websites 100%. Okay, and 7.1, 7.2, 7.3 each gave us um, 15 to 20 percent increases down the line. We kind of hit the wall as to what we can do there. Okay, so they're looking at things like this and things like the uh, the JIT, the just in time compiler. But this loads all of those in memory. Now, most people are not going to want to load all of Drupal and all of its supporting classes in there because there's a, a the law of diminishing returns kicks in. Okay. Um, what they're finding is you can get most of the improved the speed improvement by identifying the top 100 classes and using those. These days, that's not really easy. You can guess at what are going to be your your top ones, but there's no good tools to do that unless you're using cache grind or something to look at what's actually happening. And at that point, you can identify them. What's the most frequently used uh, items and objects? Yes, the most frequently used objects. Or the 100 most frequently used objects will get you about 90% of the savings. OK? Sure, you can go ahead and load. If you want that extra 10%, you can go ahead and load everything else in. It's not going to hurt anything um, as long as you've got the RAM. Okay? Right. As long as the hardware resources are available. Yes, that is kind of very important. Um, one of the things is, uh, I mentioned, uh, I just kind of glossed over, opcode compiles everything and loads it into memory, but opcode has the option of saying, do you want this to refresh if the file changes, okay? Preloading does not have that. Once it's in memory, it's in memory. You have to bounce your web server to, if there are any um, new ones. Now, for most people, that's fine. Most of us don't really care. Once in production, once it's set, it's running. That's it. Okay. Um, but if you do have files that will dynamically change, then you don't want to bring those in to preload. You want to let those um, load. And it's perfectly fine to have your your top 100 preloaded and everything else dynamic. Okay. That, that's not going to cause any problems. Oh yeah. If you preload class A, and class A depends on these four interfaces, these five traits, and these two base classes, then all of those have to be preloaded. Now, that's real easy. When you require um, class A, it's going to go ahead and bring the other stuff in for you. You don't have to do any extra work for it. But you do need to plan on that. If you inherit, or if you require a class that has a huge inheritance tree and it's going to bring it. Zen Framework's horrible at this, okay? Um, Zen Framework, everything is dependent on everything else. And I use the Zen Framework Twitter client an awful lot. And it literally has like 30 or 40 different classes involved in just making a tweet, okay? Um, and if I preload the Zen Twitter client, all of that's going to come in with it, okay? Not a problem. You just need to make sure you got the memory because you didn't plan on it. You planned on bringing that one little, and the, the Zen Twitter clients maybe 500 lines of code. There's another thousand behind it. So, oh, since you're new, um, don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay. Stop being asked. Okay. So, preloading. If we preloaded 
base Drupal. When I say base Drupal, I'm saying like the the uh, like we, we got an understanding of what most Drupal. Wouldn't that be better on the shared host together if it was a uh, if they had like base Drupal and, and preload? As long as everybody was using the exact same version of Drupal at all times, because once it's preloaded in memory, you can't overwrite. Somebody else can't overwrite. Okay. Now, I run my own server, and I come from a broken household, okay? Uh, my wife is a Drupal developer. I'm a WordPress developer. So, uh, <laughs> but in, I, I run my own um, server, and I've got 10 instances of WordPress running. And whenever I update WordPress, I've got a script that I fire off and boom, everything's updated. So it would not be a problem for me to preload WordPress in there and then just update and balance. Not a problem. Uh, if you're on a sh traditional shared hosting where you've got other neighbors that may not be on the same level, it's not going to be possible. Because once it's preloaded, the preload will always take precedent. You can try to require once and define something else. It's not going to work. Thirteen to seventeen percent increase. Yay! Let's talk about PHP 8 for a little bit, because I didn't think I would actually get to this point. We've got about 10, um, 10 minutes, so we're going to talk about this. Union types. Remember I told you, you missed it, but earlier I talked about the fact that we can catch um, two different types of exceptions in one catch statement these days, with, catch, with exception, pipe, exception. We'll do both of them. Union types are coming down the pipe, where I can say I'm going to pass in a foo or a bar, a float or an int a string or an int. Don't ever do that, please. <laughs> um, and I'm going to get back an int or a float. Now, this sounds really stupid, especially when I'm um, using scalars to describe it. But I live in the world of WordPress. And WordPress loves to do things. I, I work a lot with the WordPress REST API. I actually wrote a book on it. And the REST API likes to do a lot of weird things like we're going to return, our main method is we're going to return a WordPress REST payload, which is what you were looking for, or a WordPress REST error, yeah. which is totally different, has no shared structure at all. So I've got, I can't type in that because I can't say this is going to return this or this drives me up the wall. Well, now I'm going to be able to type in my method because it's going to have either a payload or an error. That's going to be fun. This is the next level in type hinting. Doesn't look like generics are going to happen, but this will happen at least in 8.0. Yes. So will it? Ha will I be able to null it? So it will it be? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and but the null will apply to all of them. Okay. okay. You can't say int or null int or float. Oh. Okay. You'll have to say null int or float. Yeah. Okay. Good question. See if you here earlier, you could have won the elephant. He won it by default. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, this one's cool. This is a little syntactic shorter, but we now have the static method colon colon class on classes, on instances. On variables. Yes, well, as long as, it's a, as, long as the, the variable is a class, yeah, or uh, is an object. So I no longer have to do um, get class to, and pass it the variable to get its class. I can instantiate foo and I can var dump dollar sign foo colon colon class. And that will give me that. And again, it, it doesn't sound like a lot until you get deep into some of these, uh, things, especially testing. Yeah. Testing, I am always going to, do I have the right class? You know, well, no, I do. Woohoo, just in time compiler. For the record, you have after the fact compilers, which is what we're all normally used to. You have dynamic classes, which are compiled on demand, which is what PHP is. And you have the just-in-time compilers. And languages like um, Java utilize just-in-time compilers. And I, uh, I, I do a podcast, Voices of the Elephant, Voices of the Elephant, Elephants, PHP, uh, dot com. I have an interview dropping on Tuesday. I interviewed Derek Reetons and Sarah Goldman. If you don't know who they are, they are two of our old-school core developers. They've been doing this longer than I've been in the community. And the, we, we talk about the just-in-time compiler for most of that 30 minutes. Um, the just-in-time compiler, when it was originally pitched, um, and we've been talking about this since the late five days, um, everybody says that you're just not going to get enough for it. And there's still some debate of whether you're going to get enough for it. But it turns out 
that packages like Drupal will actually see an increase because the just-in-time compiler, as things are running, it says, oh, you're calling the you know, method X. Oh, hey, you're calling method X. How about the sixth or seventh time um, the just-in-time compiler says, hey, I know how to deal with X. You don't have to keep compiling that over and over. I've already got that over here. So it's going to keep that method compiled over here. And next time you call method X, it goes, oh, hey, I know that. So I'm going to use that. We could see normally, um, I think it's, um, Sarah said, it's 5 to 13% increase overall just by using the just-in-time compiler. If you want to benchmark and play with it now, if you've got your own um, server, you can actually turn the just-in-time compiler on in PHP 7.4. You recompile PHP, but you can actually turn it on. And you can get, um, get away with it. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you the very brief version. I've got a whole talk. Uh, one of my keynotes on which way is the elephant pointed, and I talk about the just-in-time compiler for five minutes. The gist of it is, is the just-in-time compiler is going to make PHP a first-class citizen for machine learning because it will speed up long-running processes. And we already have libraries in PHP, sorry, I'm not going to ignore you. We already have libraries in PHP for machine learning, but PHP being dynamically compiled, it is not a good choice for it. Now it's going to be a good choice. So, hey, hey, we're not going to have Python developer goes, geez, I can use PHP now. Okay? <laughs> but what we're going to have is PHP developers that say, I don't have to go to Python just to implement machine learning in my um, pro projects. Is that mostly like scalable vector machines or? I have no idea. I, I know. Because I, I, I started getting into machine learning. I was looking at that. And I was like, man, it'd be cool if I could use my existing PHP knowledge and then. Yep. Well, you'll be able to now. Uh, there, there is. A library that, from what I understand, there's only one right now. Um, if you go out to packages.org and type in uh, machine learning, you'll, you'll find it, or go out to GitHub, because that's where it's stored. Uh, but there is one, and it supports most of the major, I don't know what to call them. They, 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 I like to call them types, but I know that's not what they're officially called. But there's several different types of machine learning, and that library just supports all of them. And that's really all I've got for you. I'm honestly surprised that we made it through in time, but I hit my number. Uh, hey, if you have any questions, if you want a copy of these slides, uh, I'll send you a PDF. I don't normally release my slides, but if you think this is going to help you, hey, hey, I'm happy to, to send it to you. Drop me an email, cal at calevans.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I randomly talk about managing developers and PHP. I've been a PHP cheerleader for the past 16 years. Yes. You're welcome for that mental image. But, uh, <laughs> You can also find me at blog.calevans.com, and I run a, a couple times a year, I run a virtual conference just for PHP developers called Daycamp, the number four, developers.com. Love to see you at the next one. Uh, looks like the next one's going to be on testing. Not unit testing, testing in general. We're going to talk about unit testing, we're going to talk about acceptance testing, we're going to talk about a bunch of different stuff, and I've already got a couple of speakers lined up for that. Um, that's going to be fun. So, um, anyhow, that's everything I got. I hope you've enjoyed it.